welcome to episode 167 of the Highly Relevant Podcast, a show about how Latinx pop culture is reshaping mainstream entertainment. I'm your host, Jack Rico, and this week I interview director Lisette Feliciano, who has a new indie film out called Women is Losers, starring Lorenza Izzo. It's about a Latina immigrant in San Francisco who tries to get herself out of poverty. She tells me how lies about Latinos in the media has been the driving force behind the mantra of her production company and the stories she tells. She also lets me in on how she raised funds for her own film and how young producers can do the same for themselves. But before I talk to Lisette Feliciano, it's time I give you my weekly recap of the top Latinx pop culture headlines in a segment I like to call Jacked In. Let's begin with the top movie TV music news of the week. Ana de Armas is in talks to lead a female John Wick spinoff called Ballerina. Isa Gonzalez joins the Scott Z. Burns' Apple drama Extrapolations. Olivia Rodrigo has been nominated as the Artist of the Year for the 2021 American Music Awards. Penelope Cruz's new drama On the Fringe is filming now in Madrid. The Mexican Beverly Hills family comedy from Eric Galindo and Wilmer Valderrama is in the works at CBS. Speaking of CBS, Viacom CBS buys a majority stake in Spanish content producer Fox Tele Colombia and Estudios Telemexico. Netflix unveils their slate of upcoming Spanish film series and reality shows with Elite renewed for season six. Netflix also sets cast for the Spanish Bird Box spinoff that starred Sandra Bullock. And the Critics' Choice Awards will air January 9th, 2022 on TBS and The CW. And in tech and social media news, Twitter hits 211 million daily active users. Paramount's A Quiet Place horror film is being adapted into a video game. Facebook renames itself into parent company Meta. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas is coming to Oculus Quest too. Tesla owners can now remotely stream live footage from their car's cameras. Spotify expects to have over 400 million users by the end of the year, beating Apple by a lot. Amazon is building a clubhouse competitor that turns hosts into DJs. And Apple and Comcast have set a two-way streaming distribution deal. So earlier this year, I had a chance to attend the virtual South by Southwest Film Festival and had a chance to see several films, including Women is Losers from director Lisette Feliciano. Now, if you haven't seen the film or heard about it, the film is set in the 1960s in San Francisco where Selena Guerrera, played by Lorenza Izzo, a once promising Catholic schoolgirl who sets out to rise above the oppression of poverty and invest in a future for herself that sets new precedents for the time. You wanna buy a house so you can never be kicked out. The film has a pretty nice cast that also includes Simu Liu, who just starred in Shang-Chi, also Stephen Bauer from Scarface, Shalim Ortiz and Brian Craig from ABC's Grand Hotel, and Chrissy Fitt from Pitch Perfect. Visually, Feliciano sends the message that she's interested in telling American multicultural stories for everyone. But ironically, she's realized that it's not as simple to live out a multicultural life within her own Latinidad. I am very proud of my culture and I'm very proud of being multicultural. I'm proud that I was born in San Francisco. I'm proud that I grew up in, in this country. I'm proud that I have relatives um, from Latin America, from Spain, from Puerto Rico. I'm proud of all of those things. And this decision that it has to be one or the other is um, just not something I'm going to feed into because it's not my reality. It's not the reality of my friends. Um, and I'm also not going to perform it for anybody either. <laughs> When you say perform it, what do you mean by that? It feels sometimes like it seems like when we get some of these movies or we get some of these these characters, we finally get uh, we finally get a little bit of representation. It seems very checkboxy in a weird way. What we did for this movie was we didn't call attention to it. We just allow these characters to be people, and in them being allowed to be just people. Um, and not calling attention to it, not, you know, dra- you're not, we're not draping flags, we're not doing any of that stuff. We're just kind of human beings mm-hmm. in a story. I feel like that has what's really helped a lot of people feel like this movie is for everybody. And that, you know, the Latinx community mm. does see the movie, the Latino community does see the movie. And I hope that they see pride in it because it's not performative. We're not performing Latinidad for anybody. In your own words, why did you want to make this movie? Movies are extremely hard to make. Movies are very hard to fund. So you have spent so much time in this. What was the motivating factor for you? What was the thing that was driving you every day when things got difficult? When things didn't seem they were going to work out, you're like, I'm still going to go on because you wanted to reach an objective. What was that? Truth, really. 
Um, when I made the film, the country was going through a, a situation where we had a lot of people with a lot of airtime saying things about a community um, that people were cheering that I didn't understand how they could cheer something. And it really dawned on me that, oh, they just don't know us. But <laughs> they're just they're unfamiliar with us. So you didn't use, you didn't think hate. You said it's ignorance instead of hate. Unfamiliarity. It's unfamiliarity. And it's it's something that's mm -hmm. happened just within the Latino community. But it, when we say this very clearly in the movie, it happened in the Asian American community. You know, they yeah. had a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act. And that's they right. had a law to pull, literally, in law, Chinese people cannot come here. They cannot marry white people. They cannot do these things. And so it's all cyclical, right? The Italians went through it. The Irish yeah. went through it. The, Pol the Polish people went through it. Um, and it seems like we're the next iteration of this similar <laughs> assimilation growing pain. And yeah. so I saw these things happening. I saw these people, say, this, people saying things about a community that just were untrue. I mean, you've seen this movie now. For someone to tell my mother, who worked three jobs and never slept, so that I could have an education that she's lazy or that she's bringing this country down in some way, was I, as a daughter of that culture, cannot stand for that. I won't stand for that. And it's not about not being proud of that. It's about being respectful of it. And so when I say, when I'm, when I'm cautious with these words and when I'm cautious about how we're, we're, we're talking about ourselves, the reason is because of wanting to be very respectful and being very honorable about how it's being portrayed. So in not calling attention to it, I am allowing all of the attention to be called to it. Mm -hmm. I want you to be able to see yourself as a Latino man watching this movie, as a, as a Latinx person, someone that grew up here. I want you to be able to see that. I want you to be able to be proud of it. And I want you to be able to be proud of it in a way that's not performative. Great cast you have here. Yes. Uh, Lorenza Big Gat. And I mean, Simu Lu, I mean, you got Simu before Shang-Chi. It's, it's like <laughs> crazy. I'm like, what? That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, you got Brian Craig from Grand Hotel, Shalim Ortiz, a veteran, a bilingual actor. Uh, you got Chrissy Fitz, Stephen Bauer. I'm very impressed with the cast you got here. How were you able to get this cast? Um, thank you. Thank you. The cast is amazing. Um, it, they, you know, I really have to give it to them because they had all been doing really big stuff. Like Simo, even before, even before Shang Chi had been doing Prince Convenience, he had a massive following already. Um, you know, Brian Craig had just gone off Grand Hotel. Lorenzo had just been on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Like Chrissy had been pitch perfect. Like they'd been on the biggest sets of all time. And I asked them to come to a smaller film and have an opportunity to say something they hadn't had an opportunity to say before. This was Lorenzo's first leading role. And you've seen her now in the movie. So the fact that this is her first leading role and she's been around for seven, eight years is kind of the thesis of the film, unfortunately. Um, and I hope that that changes now that she's had the opportunity to, to really show the versatility and the braveness that she has. And, and you know, we are definitely making a big push for that come next season. Um, and I hope that our community can really rally around her because it, it is rare and it is hard. It was hard to do this. It was very hard. It was every day, it was, it's financing and money and, and conversations and, and it's been difficult. So I really hope that our community sees that and really rally, rallies around it. And so far we have, I mean, I'm, we get kind of stopped a little bit on the street, mostly within the Latinx community. And you just see the pride, <laughs> the pride, especially in the older generation, the pride of like, hey, the thing that we said we wanted to come here for better lives for our children is happening. And that's that's really beautiful for us. Um, but yeah, the cast, it, they, you know, I try to cast for people um, because I believe the talent is there. Obviously, if you're an actor, you've gotten to the point where you've done the training, you've done the work. But if it doesn't like land in truth or in some type of, I do a lot of grounding techniques. I work a lot, a lot with energy. If that's not present, then it's not going to really translate to the audience. And I think what you're seeing here is that the fire that every actor had about the story is what's popping through. So your production company is called Look at the Moon Pictures. Uh, and from what I understand, it develops original content that shines a hero's lens on underrepresented groups, such as ourselves. Why did you decide that that was going to be the mantra of your production company? Because it had to be. <laughs> it had to be. 
this is my reality. My reality is I grew up in a multicultural world. Um, my friends are from all different races. I have multiple races and multiple cultures in my own family. And what I was tired of was seeing these them represented in ways where they weren't heroes. Um, they couldn't mm. be heroes. They were either the sidekicks or they were the, co- the comedic relief. And even now, they, I mean, you don't have to throw a stone pretty far on TV to see that like currently the comedic relief genre is the Latino character. Um, and it wasn't like that, but you know, it, in, in every every single uh, race or ethnicity has gone through that, right? They used to be yeah. Americans, they used to be Asians, Asian American community, and, and it is still in, in some ways, but right now it seems like, at least what you can see is, you know, the Latinx character is the funny comedic relief. So when we started the company, we were working a lot with um, with social justice groups and the the, mantra, the theme was always, okay, we're gonna use the big lenses. We're gonna use all, we're gonna use all the money. We're gonna use the Atlas Anamorphics because Atlas Anamorphics makes, you know, it makes the character front and center. It's yeah. a superhero. It's a superhero lens. And those lenses don't get used for these types of stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted to take that and, and put it for these characters as well as the references. So, you know, one of the biggest movies of the 1960s was uh, The Graduate, right? And we have, that final scene with Dustin Hoffman where he's like, they're, they're sitting on and they're driving away. And that's a coming of age story, a, an American coming of age story. And this is an American coming of age story. And so I took that shot <laughs> and I put Simu Liu and I put Lorenzo Aso in. It was great. Paying attention is a graduate shot because they, these characters were also present in America in 1967. We don't see them, but they were there. That's wonderful. So I want to talk to you about the aspiring female filmmakers or filmmakers period that are listening to this interview right now. And they're looking at you and it's like, wow, I can't believe it. Lisette actually got a movie all the way to South by Southwest. I'm still writing my little script. No one will take a look at it. There's just so many of those stories, Lisette, and you know how hard it is to get there. What's some of the advice that you have for filmmakers to actually get a movie done the way you did? What are you doing right that no one else has figured out? No, I don't think I'm doing anything right that no one else has figured out at all. It, um, there was a realization in my career at some point. I went, so like, you know how Selena goes in the movie, she tries to go through the find the banks and then she tries to go through, she try, they won't let me rent a house or buy a house, but they can't stop me from building one. I went through the exact same thing, right? It was like, couldn't go through the industry, couldn't go through around the industry. And it was just like, it got to a point where I realized, oh, this is not about my talent or my abilities. This is something much bigger than me that I also don't think I can change all by my lonesome. But what I can do is I can get around it. So what I what I would say is I spent too much time trying to convince people that were unconvincible that I could do the things that I was saying I could do. And what I would do instead is to, um, as soon as someone tells you they, they don't believe you and they don't ever say it that way, they just kind of don't say anything. Um, I would move away and just go find the tribe that has done the work on themselves to stand for the potential in you because the work gets all of a sudden things are a lot faster, but it took that moment inside of myself to say, okay, there is no cavalry coming. I am the cavalry. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was empowering. It was empowering, but really like you are the cavalry. You have to guide this because unfortunately we're not in a time yet. I don't hope we're getting there. We're not in a time yet where you are given the benefit of the doubt. That second phase for any filmmaker that's aspiring, one of the biggest issues that they have, the constant articles about it, is how to raise funds to make your movie. What were some of the advice and suggestions you could probably offer of how aspiring filmmakers can raise money? You know, it just feels like everybody's broke. So you're like, well, I can't ask my friends who are struggling to just get by to give me a hundred thousand dollars to make this movie that might not make the money back because you don't make that for the money. You make that for the art and the culture. So in your particular case, how were you able to raise funds? Um, did you follow a particular business model? How did that work for you? Um, again, back to being the cavalry. I, I had a really interesting conversation with a, a, a friend of mine who's a producer um, and he and I went to the same school. We both went to Tish. And he had gotten through the Sundance route really quickly. And I remember going to him with one of my first projects saying, I just need $200,000 to make this. Like, and at the time I was like, oh my, this wasn't Women as Losers. This wasn't one I was trying to do before. 
And I remember being like, I don't know how to do this. Or I, you know, and he said something that, you know, not to put anybody on blast, but unfortunately the things that he said to me was, well, that's just for people with $50,000. And that's when it dawned on me. I was like, oh, this person knows for people with $50,000 in discretionary income. That is not my reality. I grew up in a world where if you made $50,000 a year, you were a success. Right. You're, it was like your annual salary <laughs> for some people. Yeah. So then I realized, okay, we're just on different planets at this point. And if you're hearing this, you probably are in the planet that I was on, um, which is where $50,000 is your annual salary. And yeah, this is a rich kid's game. How do you do this? Um, so what I, w- what I did in this film was call attention to that and use the limited resources that I had and I baked that into the creativity because no, I wasn't going to get a million dollars, but I could use my creativity to infuse that into the story and make it a story point. Mm. And that's why I was able to do a period film as my first film. And yeah, we have Teslas and, and, and like 19, you know, 1990s and 2021 cars because we, couldn't afford anything else. So it's making do with what you have, I would say, in terms of the financing and, and how to do the story. If you can find a way to build it into your story, this reality that you are living, it will infuse, the, um, it, it might help. It actually might just help make the film resonate more. Absolutely. Well, I have one last question here before I go. What are you working on next? Because yeah. I think that a lot of people now are like, all right, we just got a look at Lisette Feliciano's talent, and we want to be able to see more. So what's on the deck? What's on the slate? What can we anticipate from you? Oh, thank you so much. Um, and that means a lot. Um, I will continue to stand for us. I will continue to stand for us authentically and with integrity and honor. You will not, I, it, and please hold me to this. You will not see anything from me that <laughs> make us feel um, less than or funny oh we're not a joke um i think that's the the thing that you'll see from my work coming going forward we're not jokes um and i hope to bring that to television and we're working on a few tv shows now because i do think that that is a a big playing field and um it's a playing field that all the talent that i saw come to the story that we weren't even we couldn't even put everybody in i want to have a bigger playing field for them for them to be able to tell these, to tell their stories through these characters that are nuanced. So definitely TV, we have a couple of films coming out and, you know, I hope that I can bring this conversation. I can bring this voice and perspective to the studio system. I think that would be, um, we need it um, so badly. My audience will find me. <laughs> I'll be pushing for that. So yeah, that's, that's my, uh, that's my goals. And just before I wrap up here, here are three Latin tracks you might want to add to your playlist this weekend. Mi fiesta, banda los chinos. Sammy Arriaga, Ovio. Cuestión de suerte, Natalia Lacunza. That's it for episode 167 of the Highly Relevant Podcast. I'd like to thank Lisette Feliciano for coming on the show. If you like this episode, please share with your friends and have them subscribe and leave a review. You'll be helping us reach more people. If you would like to get in touch with me, reach out to me on Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. I'm Jack Rico. See you next week on another episode of Highly Relevant. Highly Relevant.